On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County, I want to thank you for attending and becoming informed citizens about the issues facing our county. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which engages and in, encourages informed and active participation in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League never supports or opposes any political party or candidate. I encourage those of you who are not League members to consider joining the Sonoma County League at lwvsonoma.org and to visit 411.org for nonpartisan information on this year's candidates and issues. This forum is for Healdsburg City Council. This forum is being recorded and will be accessible through the website, lwvsonoma.org, and our YouTube channel. The recording will be available in its entirety without any editing of the content. All recordings of candidate forums are the sole property of the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. You may share the link of the full recording However, you may not use excerpts of any portion of the forum for campaign purposes. We want to thank Watson Lab and Ricardo Ibarra for providing this excellent interpretation service. The candidates will provide a one minute opening statement and will be have a one minute closing statement in reverse order that they opened up. Candidates will have 90 seconds to answer each question. We have a timekeeper who will signal when the speakers need to wrap up their response. League members have created a set of questions to get us started. We encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A button on the Zoom screen at any time during the forum. We will ask as many of your questions as time allows, and we may combine similar questions. Your questions may not be partisan in nature or directed to only one candidate. If you have submitted a question which has not been asked, we encourage you to follow up with the candidates. Due to this virtual format, there may be some freezing of screens or other technical glitches, which we will address as efficiently as possible. We thank you for your patience and understanding. Before the forum started, I showed the candidates how their names were picked to establish the speaking order. To ensure fairness, as we proceed with questions, we will consistently rotate between the candidates. We will now begin with opening statements. Ms. Kelly, your opening one minute statement, please. Thank you, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight's forum. It's an honor to get to be with you all, and thank you for tuning in and wanting to learn more. Now more than ever, we need leadership. I believe we are facing a housing crisis that is pushing families out of Healdsburg at a record pace. Uh, the rising cost of living that's impacting our working class and our fixed income seniors, and we're seeing really flat revenue projections for the city, um, but expenses are on the rise. Our local businesses are trying to stay afloat after being impacted by fires, the pandemic, uh, and lower than expected tourism numbers. Plus, they're now being threatened by national chain stores signing leases and coming to town in Healdsburg. The decisions that our leaders make today are going to influence Healdsburg for years to come. And these nuanced decisions require leadership decisions as how do we push for economic recovery while also advancing protections for our most vulnerable? How do we advance the right housing policies while also acknowledging that we've reached our capacity on hotels and more than enough luxury housing? Uh, these decisions requires the skill and experience that I possess. That's why I'm running for re-election to the Healdsburg City Council. I'm a mom, a nonprofit executive. Thank I'm you for your opening statement. Ms. Cade, your opening statement, please. You're muted. There you go. Thank you. My background is in management, uh, business ownership, hospitality, financial services, and retail. I'm a mother to three and a grandmother to two. As a life and health coach, I'm concerned that our mortality rates are up by 33% in the last few years. And I believe I believe the, oh, and proper care and retention of our natural resources, including dams. I support farmers who uh, feed people. And in 2022, when I ran for city council, they said, what are you gonna do about the drought, Linda? My family's been here for four generations. I said, it's probably gonna be a wet year. And it was. I'd like to see less taxpayer funded consultants uh, reports and I want to run a more efficient government and prioritize water security. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hagerly, your opening statement. Good evening. My name is David Hagley, and I'm the mayor of Healdsburg, and I'm really excited about the future. During my time on council, we've had a uh, we've done a lot and made massive improvements to our long term water security, stabilizing our budget, and most of all, housing. In the next four years, we'll see the family fully family pavilion transform into a new home for the Healdsburg Farmers Market, as well as community events. Progress on the Smart Train finally coming to Healdsburg. And with your help, pass measure O, and together we can work to create the opportunity for the desperately needed homes our middle-class families, workforce, and seniors need. I have a solid track record of being a steady and fierce advocate for Healdsburg at the local, state, and federal level because Healdsburg is our home. I look forward to earning your vote in November to continue serving you uh, with my institutional knowledge and my common sense approach to public service with a smile and sometimes a sparkly jacket. Thank you. Mr. Edwards, your opening statement. Yeah, good evening. I'm Ron Edwards. I ran in 2022 to fill the vacated two-year partial term. Many of you had no idea of my political policy background involvement since 2017. So I set out to introduce myself by knocking on every registered voter's door. I had many long conversations with over 4,000 doors knocked on. But these conversations, I earned your trust and was elected to the council. Those conversations let me know what some of the core issues were and helped me fine tune my focus. Like many of you, I've been in Healdsburg a long time, and for me, that's over 32 years. As a retired resident on a fixed income, I can relate to many of you. I take many positions as a senior commission liaison very seriously and participate in many events at our senior center. I round out our current council and I work hard to make sure that e even if you disagree with the position I have taken, you will know I have put a lot of time into learning the details. I will always try to ask the question you have on the subject, and I'm always concerned that just because you're not in the room, I'm interested in your opinion. I have the time to meet for coffee. Once again, I'm knocking on 4,000 plus doors of registered voters in Hillsburg. Ms. Hannon Kramer, your opening statement, please. You're muted. Good evening. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, for generations, um, Hillsburg has been home to my family. Um, my Aunt Olga Hannon, who passed away in 2020 at 97, uh, was born and raised on the Corbell Winery Ranch um, and married my uncle, who was a World War II Purple Heart vet, and they lived on White Gates Avenue for 51 years. I'm a proud native Californian um, who grew up in a middle class family um, with very um, Irish Catholic values, very traditional values. And um, my father was a veteran of the Korean War, an aviator and an entrepreneur. <clears throat> I spent most of my holidays right up here in Hillsburg. Um, so I have very fond memories of going to dinner um, at Dry Creek Kitchen and going to the B&B &B, uh, when it was in the square uh, and John and Zeke's when it was in the square um, and meeting my aunt at Adele's for breakfast. Um, so I definitely feel like Hillsburg is home. Now as a wife and mother to two young daughters, um, my husband and I are teaching our girls to cherish the community, respect the environment and help our neighbors. Where better to do that than your family here in Healdsburg as a business Thank you professional. for your opening statement. The first question for all of you is what do you see as the most critical issues facing Healdsburg? And we'll start with you, Ms. Hannon Kramer. I think Healdsburg is at a real inflection point. Um, I believe that we are at a place where there's a lot of mistrust and a lack of transparency. And I think the first issue to be addressed is really listening and collaborating with community again and understanding what the community's needs are um, in relation to where we are now as a city and where we want to go in the future. Um, so I think making sure that we have an open line of communication and really are putting the needs of the city around affordable housing, um, around the climate mobilization strategy, and around um, the arts and culture and diversity of economy um, in the forefront. Ms. Kelly, what do you see as the most critical issues facing Healdsburg? I see a community that is really struggling to maintain our middle class to uh, ensure that families can continue to afford to live here and that those who have invested a lot of time in building local small businesses are able to uh, stay afloat. I think that we have a number of pretty uh, complex policy issues that are before us as a city, uh, whether it was the need to have to unfortunately raise, raise our water rates because 
we have fixed costs across a system uh, that are a very aging system and not having a lot of uh, new customers joining us, we have to spread that cost amongst the customers we have. And unfortunately, that means making difficult decisions that we know will, will greatly impact our neighbors. Um, I think that having uh, someone on the council who has experience working in small business, working in our nonprofit community, partnering with our Latino community, someone like me, uh, who is not only an attorney with a master's of business administration and a lot of experience in policymaking. Uh, I sat on the planning commission for Sonoma County for three years prior to being elected to the city council in 2020. I know how to uh, parse through some of those complex issues and deliver solutions that are gonna work for our community. So I think those are kind of the ones that come to mind, but I know that there's lots of folks uh, really struggling in our community and, and having council members that will always listen and have an open door policy and be responsive. I think that's what folks have found in me on the council and, and something that I'll continue to do going forward. Ms. Kate, what do you see as the most critical issues facing Healdsburg? All right, I'll unmute. Um, it seems to be Measure O is pre pretty contentious, and we do need middle-income family housing and support for small businesses. And I feel like I'm in a unique position having a lot of business background and experience and having a lot of uh, relationships in the community and being able to relate to and listen to and uh, help people in general. The energy policy is constrictive and that needs to be looked at. I want to know where is the funding for infrastructure? There's got to be some funding for infrastructure and why haven't we found something like that so we don't have to raise the water rates as much as we have. People are stressed out enough and we need to focus on small business and I'd like to see more for our youth to do. We used to have a roller skating rink and a bowling alley. So I want to focus on family friendly policies that can help the normal people and cut back on hotels and catering to tourists. Mr. Haley, what do you see as the most critical issues facing Hillsburg? Well, there's two main ones, um, housing and water. Uh, when I ran uh, the first time in 2016, the press Democrat endorsed me. Um, it was really important for me to, to have the voice of somebody with young children raising their family in Healdsburg on city council because we hadn't had that in a while. Um, now we have uh, Councilmember Kelly with a couple kids in our local schools, Councilmember Harrods, got high school kids. So we've got a really good perspective of that. But the press Democrats endorsement back in 2019 was as the father of two young children, he says he's concerned about the ability of families to afford to stay in Healdsburg. His expertise in property financing would be an asset as the city pursues creative ways to build low income and market rate residential units. And I've delivered on that. I worked with uh, um, uh, some local brokers to be to allow the city to put under contract three apartment buildings that were going to be flipped to market to maintain those for our neighbors. Um, I've done a lot when it's related to housing. Uh, the bigger issue, though, that we have, not the bigger, but the other issue we have is really related to water. And over the last couple of years, we have done a lot. The community as a whole and us as a city council, whether it's uh, finalizing the funding for a purple pipe or uh, uh, approving to the, dis the design and engineering of three aquifer storage and recovery wells, using FEMA grant funding that we've worked on over the years. So there's a lot in the pipeline that's really exciting to me to achieve those goals. Mr. Edwards, what do you see as the most critical issues facing Healdsburg? Yeah, as being here 32 years, running a catering business for 27 of those, I have seen how our community has changed. Uh, growing up in Marin County, I've kind of got an early preview of how housing and cost of living just continue to increase. I think one of the really critical issues is having good communication between our government and our residents and helping those two come together. A lot of our residents are concerned about housing and want middle class housing, but at the same time are concerned that we would be overbuilding. So it's really vital 
that as I talk with people who uh, want their kids to stay in town because rents are rising because we don't have more inventory. So we need to find a balance of increasing housing so that residents can stay here as well as our seniors. There are a number of seniors who have two-story homes, large homes that they want to downsize. And traditionally, those seniors were able to downsize into smaller units, and therefore those houses became available. We don't have that in this town now, so it's very important that we work to build new middle-class housing so that we can house our residents, we can have fewer cars coming into town, and that way we'll have a better balance, uh, more the way the town used to be as opposed to how we are now where we have low-income housing and really expensive housing. Uh, that's the current issue that we really need to focus on. In order to provide the candidates time to answer more questions, I'm only going to ask the question once of the entire group. If a candidate would ask, like me to repeat it, I will do so. Question two, how will you make sure your constituents are engaged? And we'll start with Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I am very engaged. I have more coffee than I ever thought I would ever have. Uh, I meet with residents. I engage. Um, I'm kind of old fashioned. Uh, rather than communicating via email, I'd rather sit down and have a conversation because that way we can get in depth. We can really go into the details of what someone's really concerned about. So I think that those are issues that me being available for people feeling that they have a voice that they can reach out and have someone explain things to them as I'm doing now as I'm knocking on doors uh, over 2000 right now. And many times I have good 20, even 30 minute conversations with our residents about what's on their mind. They're very happy to be able to have personal engagement with their elected representatives. And I think that that's extremely important. And I will continue to do that. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Yeah, I think, um, you know, making sure that the community and constituency feels heard. Um, you know, having a lot of conversations, again, is a, is a great idea, making sure that there is a two-way conversation between leadership and the community. Um, understanding really what the community needs, I think, you know, is critical. And, you know, thus far, I think we've left the community a little bit short. Um, I do feel like, you know, engaging on a one-on-one -on -one basis is critical. And, um, you know, to Ron's point of having coffee, very important. I, too, have been having a lot of coffees. But I've also been getting out into Rotary and Kiwanis and, and into the community, um, arts and culture, um, creative leadership meetings, um, reaching out to businesses in town and understanding what's going on in the valleys. Um, I think a lot of um, Hillsburgers that live in Alexander Valley and that live in Dry Creek Valley feel like they aren't being heard at all and that they have no say because they aren't necessarily, um, you know, part of the voting population. Um, so I think, you know, making sure you're not just you know, it's focusing on the people that can vote here in town, which is important, of course, but I think all of Healdsburg as a collective um, needs to be included in that conversation. Everyone has um, something to say that is really meaningful and should be added to the conversation in general. Ms. Kelly. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so I created a bilingual monthly newsletter that's open for everyone. And since elected to the council back in 2020, I've been putting out that newsletter, just highlighting what are the issues that are happening before the city. Uh, anyone can subscribe to my newsletter by visiting my website, arielkelly.com. And one of the things I found before I was elected and just as a resident who was engaged in going to the council meetings is that it felt really frustrating at times. You would go to the city council meetings and one to participate and learn what was going on, but it felt like by the time the issue was coming before the council, it was already a done deal and that your voice didn't matter. And so what I found and, and learned over the years of just being engaged was that getting involved early on and knowing what was coming down the pipeline and being able to weigh in um, was a great way to get to um, participate and, and have my voice heard. And so I find that putting that information out there to residents, whether it's on social media or on um, Nextdoor or other avenues where, where people are engaging uh, or in my newsletter or to the local uh, clubs like Kiwanis the Rotary and, and being involved and showing up and just talking to folks, um, letting them know what's coming in the future, which is a great way to get their input now uh, and ensuring that, that their voice is a part of the process. So I do find that uh, making sure that we're talking to people early on and, and inviting them into the conversation, uh, people 
people can always email me and I'm, I respond to that, but I know that it takes a lot of different avenues to reach people. Thanks. Ms. Kate. Thank you. Um, engaging with our constituency is really important. And part of the way I do that is through participating and volunteering in um, the senior center. I was on the board for Little League, so a lot of people know me from there. Um, volunteering with Corazon and uh, the Foss Creek cleanup, I'll be doing that. And I think snail mail is a really effective way through the energy bill. So I would hope to try to get more of that going on. I know people hear about the bird bikes, but they're not really happy about that. And the EV, they get a lot of information about that. But there are a lot of other issues that people want to know about. So I would like to keep them abreast through snail mail and by engaging in the community like I have been for, for years. Thank you. Mr. Hagley. So I'll just touch on real quick. The best way to do it is just be active. I think, um, I think anybody in town has seen me at pretty much every event. Uh, our family is ingrained and in, has been ingrained in the local community, whether it's Little League, 4-H, um, you know, you very quickly learn that FFA is not just a parade. It's a lifestyle and you really get to know the community members and it's a whole different, um, You, ha it, it's another aspect of the community that really doesn't, that you don't really get exposed to. And so you really need to do your best to become part of you know, try to engage with different parts of the community so that you're you're part of it. Um, I, I can't say enough about the prune packers. <laughs> um, just you see everybody multi-generational at those games. What I will say is I'll take this forum to just tell everybody to sign up for the city manager's update. There's a lot that the city has done. When I first got on council in 2016, I got an email from the city manager and Ray Holly from the Tribune was copied. And I called the city manager. I said, hey, is this okay to post on my Facebook page? He says, yeah, it's public record. You can do it. So I started posting them. Next thing you know, those uh, city manager updates got a little tighter, more detailed. And now we have a city manager update that comes out every couple of weeks with photos. It has updates of what's going on. The other thing that uh, during my time I helped to get on there was uh, the upcoming items on the agenda. So go take a look at the agenda, scroll to the very last page and you'll see the next three or four meetings of upcoming items. So you can kind of highlight it and put a note of what interests you to keep track of. Thank you. The next question is, what are your thoughts on strategies to address homelessness, such as safe parking programs and enforcement of camping bans? Mr. Hageley, we'll start with you. I literally just muted. <laughs> um, we've we've done a lot when it comes to uh, uh, homelessness, addressing homelessness. And in fact, I, um, Healdsburg is one of the leading cities in the county uh, on what we've been able to do um, because of our, our staff having the housing director that that we hired back in 2019 uh, to really focus on accessing the grant funding that's available. We were ready when the project home key funds were available for us to purchase the LM village. And with my background in commercial real estate, I looked at the appraisal and we we're, I think we paid about $250,000 a room for a hotel in Healdsburg when comps were like 450 and $500,000 a door. That's a great deal for Healdsburg. We own that. Not only that, we had funding to uh, improve it. Um, and now the, the biggest takeaway is that our partnership with Reach for Home, where it's not just about the statistics and the, the point in time counts and all of that. I mean, that's great. You use that for, for measuring and, uh, and grant funding. But what's really key is the by names list. Reach for Home knows the homeless people in our area by name. That to me it is what it's about. It's about helping people get to a better spot, getting people that have been on the river for 30 years into, a, into homes so that we can redirect our focus to people that are about to fall into homelessness versus been ingrained in homelessness. So there's a lot that we're doing and I'm really proud of our city for everything that we've been doing. Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say I, I feel good on council of being able to support a lot of policies that were put in place by prior councils. Um, I have cast votes to continue those, but it wasn't anything that I did. It's more of what we have been doing and we have been working really hard to have a complete program. Um, and this includes uh, Jeff McGee on our police force to how we engage 
with social engagement. We are taking these people who are having difficult times and treating them as humans. We are giving them an opportunity at the LNM to come in to have a solid place to get back on their feet because they're before God. Many of us, one illness, one bad situation can put us out of our home. And it's really tenuous that we treat these people with respect. And with that, they are able to go through the LNM program with Reach for Home. And really, the best thing we had been doing is getting these people in permanent housing. And Stephen Sotomayor, our housing director, has done a great job. Uh, I've been encouraging him to come up with creative ways to reach out to landlords, because that's really the key, is that we can get them off the street. We can get them into the LM, But to really have them be successful, we need to get them set up in successful long-term housing so that they can get back on their feet and become productive again and feel like they are contributing to society. Ms. Hannah Kramer. Um, great question. I mean, I, I think um, so far from what I've learned in my education of what City Council and Healdsburg has done thus far, some really incredible programs. I think the work's been highly commendable. I mean, I think the word I think of the word strategy though is is having a little bit larger uh, broad strokes plan. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm curious to look into and understand a little bit more about what the strategy, you know, for not having so much falling into homelessness. Like what is the living, what are we doing around the living wage? What are we doing to impact our farm workers and give them benefits and understand where we're at with the economics of Healdsburg right now? So we can avoid, you know, strategically avoid having those issues when, when the economy is in cycles of downturn, you know, the wine industry is having um, some problems right now, as far as, you know, hospitality is down, um, wine is not selling, grapes are not selling, you know, we're, there's an influx in the economic cycle. Um, and I think, I think not paying attention to that and understanding where we are aside, and, and in addition to having the programs in place. So when those um, issues come up, we have places for them. I think addressing mental health and understanding, you know, meeting, meeting them where they are uh, and understanding where they're coming from and how we can uh, strategize in the future to make sure that we are one of the a shining star for, for homelessness and, and outreach and making sure um we don't have uh, any real homeless issues in the future. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Healdsburg is on a pathway to have functional zero homelessness in the next few years. That is something I thought would never be possible. Uh, if you would have asked me five years ago, I would have said that the, the idea of having zero homeless residents where homelessness is only temporary or moment um, would be unattainable. And it's actually within reach. It's pretty special to know that we were a part of the council that approved Healdsburg's first ever homeless shelter. In fact, the first ever full-time homeless shelter in all of Northern Sonoma County. Uh, and we definitely, it took leadership. It took guts to do that. Um, and we also, it was the perfect opportunity to seize state dollars um, to bring home that $7 million in state funding to, to build our first ever homeless shelter and, and partner with Reach for Home on delivering those services at the LM Village. Um, we now have uh, many folks moving through the shelter and into permanent supportive housing. And what I would like to, you know, just comment on is that we need housing at all levels of affordability, both for families, uh, working class residents, our seniors. And um, we know what, exactly the number of units we need. We've hired national experts to conduct a study. Um, we have 603 units of affordable housing right now in Healdsburg, many, a, a handful of those permanent supportive units for those who need that support. And we have 232 more units in the pipeline, um, several with permanent supportive housing units built in. Um, so I'm really proud of what we have done thus far. Your question about a, a shelter or parking program, I think that's a good one, um, but I don't think we're quite ready to adopt that program yet. Uh, but I think we need more housing units and then we'll have a, a way to in include that in our plans. Thank you for your response, Ms. Kate. I would like to um, give kudos to Steven Sotomayor. He's a very passionate about what he does in the housing area. And he's been very passionate about cleaning up the homeless campments. And I think we have uh, Catholic charities and reach for home. And I just want to echo what everyone else has said. We're getting to a point where it's manageable and it's under control. And I would continue to support that. Thank you. The next question is, 
How will you work with the County Board of Supervisors to address the impacts of wildfire smoke and extreme heat on farm workers? Ms. Cade, we'll start with you. You're muted. You're still muted. I'm sorry, I was asking you to repeat the question. Sure. How will you work with the County Board of Supervisors to address the impacts of wildfire smoke and extreme heat on farm workers? Well, the farm workers had a march recently and they wanted to get paid for, um, they wanted to have payment for not being able to work during the disasters. I would support farm workers in any way possible and have them not being out in the in the environment when it's a disastrous um, conditions. So I haven't really I don't really know what the Board of Supervisors is doing right now, but anything that we can do to keep people from sacrificing their health out in the environment. I would support. Mr. Higley. Yeah, I think from a Healdsburg specific standpoint, you know, we want to support our residents no matter what your status is. And we've seen that time and again where when there's challenges with, you know, whoever it is, whether it's an evacuation or people are struggling with homelessness or anything, Healdsburg uh, steps up and we do what we can to support um our neighbors in need. So, I mean, we work with the board, board of supervisors on multiple issues. I don't see this being any different than, um, you know, really the priority is Healdsburg residents. What are our residents going through and what can we do to help? Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I think one of the, the key things that we can do is that uh, we can use our legislative platform at the city level, as well as encouraging the Board of Supervisors to use their legislative platform to uh, encourage the state to have policies that will protect workers. Uh, I was also at the rally of farm workers and, and speaking with them. And it really is, when you think about it, when it's too hot, you have to go home and that's money that you're not making. I mean, if you work at Safeway, if you're a white collar worker, those issues don't affect you. But our farm workers, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, barely hanging on, uh, those are very detrimental days to them. So I think that, you know, again, working with the legislative process, um, we can get more support for those workers. We can have better wage support for them so that they are not hit as hard when they have these days and times off. Uh, and working with our climate change, working on that, not just locally, but as a state and as a federal and as a world policy, we can start reducing some of the effects of climate change to help reduce and mitigate the, the uh, extremes that we're having right now. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Sure. Um, I think having really open lines of communication with the Board of Supervisors um, and understanding, you know, the task at hand and the issues, um, I think looking at what's happening now um, and what potentially is causing that, allowing for um workers to have breaks and benefits and feel like they're, you know, not leaving without a pay paycheck to support their families and, and understanding, you know, those needs, obviously unsafe conditions are not okay. Like sticking up for and supporting um, all of our farm workers and um, allowing them to, to have a, a voice and being someone who will stand up for their rights and, you know, help them have their voice, um, I think is really critical. You know, I think, you know, drawing from my strategic background and, and working in operations and, and working, you know, cross-functionally in, in business is really helpful in these situations because you're going between, you know, county supervisor, you're going between agencies, you're you're going between policy. You want to understand, you know, what's the root cause? How can we help the now? But what can we do in the future to really improve the situation? I mean, obviously, Ron brought up a great point. Climate plays a role in all of this. Um, from a broad strokes perspective, um, obviously that that needs addressing as well. But I think making sure that that the work that the workers that are helping contribute to our economic bottom line uh, have a voice and feel supported. Thanks, Ms. Kelly. 
Thanks for the question. I think this is one that has been um, incredibly difficult to watch and see um, our county and the county board of supervisors who are, you know, well-intentioned really struggle with how to navigate through uh, what we have been experiencing in these crises in our community. Uh, we have a, a state agency in OSHA that's been tasked with overseeing workplace safety and they're underfunded. So I would say for legislatively, we need to be lobbying our state elected officials to ensure that they are fully funding OSHA so that when workers complain about safety issues at the workplace, whether it's in a factory that's overheating, uh, which we did see in, in our community in recent years, or if it's outdoors, uh, that they have a place to go and people who are going to show up and protect them. Uh, I also think, you know, from, from wildfire smoke perspective, we have the Northern Sonoma County Air Pollution Control District, which is uh, an agency under the California Air Relations Board. I sit as Healdsburg's uh, liaison and an elected member to that body. I was the chair for several years for the, our air district. And what we recently did was we created a first of its kind bilingual air quality index chart in Spanish and in English, so that AQI, which is something that we've quickly learned, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, that everyone understands what is AQI, what does it stand for, and what are the levels that are safe for working outdoors, and when is it unsafe? Uh, and it, communicating that to employers and employees who are working in our farms or in our hospitality businesses so that they are informed um, and can make safe decisions, I completely uh, relate that we need to protect those workers and stand in solidarity with them. Thank you. So uh, the next question is, what role do you see the arts playing in the future of Healdsburg and how do you think it should be funded? Ms. Kelly, we'll start with you. Uh, the arts already plays a really significant role in our community. Um, we have a really thriving creative economy now, uh, whether it's event-based like Dia de los Muertos, which is a big cult cultural festival, Day of the Dead, or the Healdsburg Jazz Festival, uh, what was formerly the Alexander Valley Film Festival, now True West Film. Uh, these are events that have long existed in our community that are, that are key both for locals and for visitors. And there is no uh, current city effort that is really supporting them in the way that they need to be supported. I believe that Healdsburg already has the ingredients to have a thriving cultural economy that the city can embrace and really help to propel us forward as a destination. Um, one of the things I'm greatly concerned about is what we're hearing and seeing in the wine industry. The consumer trends around wine, while this may be a blip on the radar, we're seeing tasting rooms close, we're seeing visitorship go down, and as a city that back in 1982 made a pretty distinct choice to go all in on tourism, which I disagree with, we need to diversify our economy, but we have the tourism infrastructure in place. And to me, it makes perfect sense. We've had residents in our community screaming for us to adopt an arts and culture master plan, which we finally did a couple years ago. Uh, we need to fully fund that plan. And I am one of, of a very small minority of council members who believes in fully funding that plan. Um, we fought for those dollars right now. It's $75,000 in our budget for implementing that arts and culture commission and hiring a staffer to run it. That's not enough money. So we need to fund the arts and do it now. Ms. Kate. Could you repeat the question? I apologize. Certainly. What role do you see the arts playing in the future of Healdsburg and how do you think it should be funded? The arts play a big role. We have so many galleries um, and I feel like they could be self-funded if they were more um, prevalent in the community. I don't know. It seems like artists can be like business people. And I don't know why the community would have to fund it. Um, they could participate in teaching youth how to be more artistic and creative. They can participate in tasting rooms and I enjoy art myself, but I don't feel like everyone in the residents in Hillsburg, I don't know if that's a big priority for them. So I would have to do some more research and get some more information, but I think we have a thriving art program, uh, art community currently. And it seems like, where, why would that go away? Mr. Hageley. Yeah, um, art is something that, I mean, the saying is in the eye of the beholder, but I think what's beautiful about art is sometimes you don't even know 
how much you're appreciating it. And, you know, the example is, you know, going back to having little kids, you know, my kids love to climb on everything. And when I got on council, really the art was, um, you know, these iron horses along the Foss Creek trail, you touch them in the summer and they're really hot. Um, and now you look at the mill district and the park that's built there. I, I kind of wish my kids were three and five again, because we would be pulling over so they could climb on the, the, whatever that structure is, it just looks fun. And that I think is what's key is how we incorporate the arts and culture master plan and the various elements into everything that we're doing, you know, from a, from whether we're looking at it through a, an equity lens or an artistic lens, there's value in all of that. Your question about funding, I think it really depends on the what, what is it you're funding? If it's uh, an element in a, in a park for private development, then you're looking at the developer. If it's something like um, the recent uh, mural on Harmon guest house, you know, that's, that's another avenue that is has some creative funding sources to make something like that happen that the entire community gets to enjoy. So that's the reason we formed the arts and culture master plan so that they can come back with recommendations on how we allocate and prioritize funding for the arts. Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we need to look at and understand that arts and culture is a very broad definition. It is, we have been having a number of art galleries open. You know, our citizens want us to be more diverse and move away from wine. And so we're having actually art galleries from other cities come into Healdsburg because we are a vibrant art community. One of the things I have been talking to the chamber about is diversifying and expanding our base of who we're marketing to. Um, we are not marketing to the African-American community in Atlanta who could come here instead of going to Napa. We are not reaching out to the Hispanic community in Miami or Florida, that these are areas that, that they're currently not marketing to. And the broader the base we have, the more people we can have coming here. And so I think as we continue to diversify what the definition of art is with our jazz festival, with our June 19th uh, events that we have in the plaza, we have a very diverse range of art and culture and Hillsburg always has. I mean, going way back to the street dance when we had a flatbed truck downtown and people would come to town and really enjoy those things. We still have a number of events that we don't forget that are free, that a uh, number of them people can attend and still enjoy the arts that are free. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Yes, it's a great question. Um, it's something I feel very passionate about. Um, my daughter is an art a uh, creative lefty. Um, we are have been incredibly involved in the arts. And, you know, what I think is important to um, reflect on is that let's get out of the, the business lens of looking at art, right? So it's not just the galleries. We're not just interested in working with the chamber and bringing in galleries from other areas. What the community is screaming for, um, as Ms. Kelly stated, is that it's really critical to have programs here for kids. There are constituents that I've met with that have supported the art community for decades before who have pulled away because they feel so disenchanted with the lack of ability and funding um, that the city has put a priority that's not around the arts and culture. So arts and culture means so much more. And it's really, I want to bring it back to the community. It has to do with our kids. You know, I'm raising a seven and three-year-old, two daughters who um, have really benefited from the social emotional piece of being in art programs from, you know, having something to do after school that's helping them process, that's, you know, lighting the fire in their creativity, that's helping them understand, you know, um, how to deal with emotions. You know, you have um, the Raven Theater that could be so much more. We have True West Films coming in that is, you know, about bringing that piece of creativity, not just the film, not just the art gallery. It's not just about the business. I really want to bring the conversation back to the community um, and understanding how we can fund programs that are art-based for kids and, and make our community um, really feel more engaged and that arts and culture is codified in our next general plan. Thank you. The next question is, what is your position on the installation of police cameras in parks? Ms. Hannon Kramer, we'll start with you. Um, it's an issue that I'm learning more about um, right now. Um, I am having meetings with um, uh, local police and fire to understand. I think, um, you know, from a safety perspective, as a mom with two young kids, um, I'm certainly concerned about the safety um, around our public spaces. Um, and I think that, 
you know, it makes sense. Um, I want to make sure that we're being thoughtful and measured in the way we're using that footage and understanding, you know, um, we don't want to be doing anything that's racially profiling or that, you know, when we are using the footage and if we are, you know, depending on that, that we have other resources that we're making decisions on and we're not just depending on what, you know, what we're seeing through that lens. Um, I think that's a really critical issue. Um, but it, as a support mechanism to ensure safety in our city, um, I, I think it's um, a good idea and, and something that is part of part of the piece of um, making sure that we have, you know, that that blanket of safety here in the city. Ms. Kelly. This was a really difficult decision that came before the council in the last couple of years, and it wasn't one that we took lightly. I think install, installing cameras, um, they don't record sound, but they do record people's movements in some of our public spaces is one of those things that you have to balance people's civil liberties uh, against challenges around community safety. Most folks, especially if there's folks tuning in from outside of Healdsburg, don't know that we've had a number of gang-related stabbings and shootings in the last several years. Some things that most people would assume doesn't happen in a community like Healdsburg. Uh, I think that this has been a failure of our community to invest upstream. Uh, we are making strides and moving in the right direction. We just cut the ribbon on a preschool uh, at the community center that'll have uh, childcare slots for toddlers, infants, and, and uh, preschoolers. And, and what is that? have to do with crime and safety? Well, we know that you're much less likely to commit crime to fall into the criminal justice system uh, if you're on a pathway to success, and that starts at birth. Uh, but what I will say is that we have a police department who's been asking for more resources. We have a very small police force in Healdsburg, and it's very expensive. It's our largest line item in our general fund. Um, so they've been asking for additional resources because they can't be everywhere all at once. And we have had some pretty dangerous situations take place in our parks and public spaces over the last several years, including a lot of theft around copper wires, which is why the lights were out on the Fox, Foss Creek pathway for a number of years. Um, we've had people at the Gibbs Park uh, doing inappropriate things in the restrooms. And so having visibility towards those things will help community safety as long as we do it um, smart and thinking about civil liberties in mind. Ms. Kate. The first when I heard that they were putting cameras in the parks. I thought like it was intrusive and I didn't think it was necessary. And, you know, spy cameras doesn't feel good. But I too have heard about gang related uh, activity, not necessarily in the park, but a Serenios gang member came actually for youth who were, a couple of them were arrested at the school, beat up somebody at their apartment complex. So do we have cameras everywhere? There's a fine line between freedom and security. So if it's necessary, then it's necessary. And if it's, if it's helping to solve crime, then I guess it's fine. So that's where I stand. I don't like to have it, but we always have had crime here. And it's nice that the police have some help. So I'm, I'm all about supporting the police to do a better job. Mr. Hageley. So I think the first thing I would say is make sure that everybody tunes into the update from our police chief. We do it annually. I think it's in March is when we do it. Um, and you'll get a real true sense of, um, you know, the, the great job that our police department is doing. Uh, the idea for cameras actually came from uh, Chief Kevin Burke, and I spoke to him about it, and it really started with, we have five entrances and exits to Healdsburg. We had a real issue with uh, some of these crimes of people coming in from out of the area. Um, we also had a, for a while there, a couple of years ago, if you recall, there was a lot of um, uh, catalytic converter thefts. Some people, their Priuses were getting hit multiple times, um, and so that's kind of where it started. Um, and then it really kicked into high gear when we had somebody going around lighting fires and we just didn't have the resources to, to, to try to track this person down as they were making their way through Healdsburg lighting fires all over, uh, which did not sit well with our with our community. So we took a very measured, cautious and eyes wide open approach to this to make sure that it is balanced. It is fair. Um, records are kept for a limited amount of time uh, so that, you know, if, if there's a request for them, 
uh, we can get the information there, but it's not, you know, there's restrictions on how it's stored, who has access, and it's very strict. And so I'm very proud of uh, what we as a council came up with to help protect the, the safety of, of our community, our families, and our children. Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I am really happy to have participated in this process from being one of two citizens that was at the very first meeting that the police department did and Flock did a presentation on what these cameras were. I took a deep dive into what other cities' policies are, what other counties, and realized that a lot of counties had been sued over this. And so it was really important to me that our information was not turned over to ICE or any other outside agency. Uh, the other issue was very important, and I think that Healdsburg has the best policy when it comes to how long we store the equipment, because, I mean, store the data, because they are used to go back and look after something has happened. It's, it's an investigative tool. There's no reason for the police to keep those records for two and a half years. If there is an incident, a stabbing or something, we can go back, look at that. And then once we see that, then the material can be retained. And that was extremely important to me on this. The other thing I want and glad we have are signs that say we have cameras because that can deter. I was talking with a police officer, retired officer, sheriff for today. And those signs, just people knowing that we're going to be having those cameras on the trails can deter uh, crime. It can make it not a convenient place to create crime. We've also had a number of stolen vehicles recovered here in town with those automatic license plate readers. And I think they are a real benefit to our community to have that investigative tool to go back when something happens in this town. We're no longer left with no tools to figure out what happened, who's responsible, and to apprehend them. Hey, I just got a question from my wife, but it's not about the Healdsburg City Council race, so I'll skip over that one. The next question about Measure O, which would amend the growth management ordinance to allow multifamily housing on the Healdsburg Avenue corridor. We'll start with Mr. Edwards. What is your position? What is each candidate's position on city measure O? Yeah, this is a really important issue. And I think it, you know, me being 65, I think I am part of the original problem in thinking what housing is. I grew up in a single family detached home with a nice lawn, good garage, but that is no longer a tenable house here in Healdsburg. I live in what I call an endangered species, a two bedroom, one bath. And if it were to be sold, it would be torn down and a new house put in. Uh, years ago, when people would buy a house, they would change the windows. Now they are taking a million dollar house and turning it into a two and a half million dollar house. Our zoning along Hillsburg Avenue, along with the growth management ordinance, have just not made it possible. We have built a number of low income housing and really expensive housing. I went back and looked. The last time we tried to adjust the GMO in 2015 with Measure R, and the argument against it was, if this passes, if we open up the GMO, we will end up with low-income housing and expensive housing. Well, it didn't pass, and that's what we got. Measure O is about thinking and planning for the future, the possibility of what can happen, because right now, with 16 units per acre, all we're going to continue to get are very expensive uh, units. So Measure O is the opportunity for the community to chime in and us to work on a plan so that we are in control of our destiny and what our housing looks like in the future, not being having it put upon us, but to really open up the possibility for people to live and work and actually walk to work in Hillsburg. I talked to a couple of mothers whose children actually live here in town and rent and they're being forced out and we need those types of people here in town. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Yeah, this is actually um, uh, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, my husband and I, um, he's an educator and part of a union, and we are renters here in Hillsburg with two young daughters and 40% of Hillsburg rents. And currently there's no representation on council for that 40%. Um, so I feel like, you know, having a voice that can actually speak to in real time, um, you know, we are a, a family that's on a middle-class income. And, you know, I think we've already experienced over the summer housing insecurity. Um, we were renting a house um, around the corner here in town and, you know, the, a for sale sign was put up because the homeowner decided he wanted to sell and, you know, line his pockets some more. So, you know, um, we had to find something in our constrained budget in that middle class, you know, housing um element um, here in Healdsburg. And it's tricky. It's really tricky. And I think that, you know, Measure O is just, 
is so important because it's just allowing us to have the next conversation. And I think there's such um, a large amount of factually incorrect information out um, in the community, unfortunately, and there's some hesitancy. But, you know, this circles back to the issue that I talked about before, where there really is a mistrust with the community members and council's ability to execute on what they say they're going to do and understanding um, and creating that transparency. And so understanding how O really is going to affect the GMO. What is, is the GMO staying around forever? You know, what, how will this affect our, the smart train coming in? So thank you. Ms. Kelly. I support Measure O and have been a part of the council conversations over the last six years um, prior to being elected and then as a member of the council to help us reach this destination and craft a ballot measure that I think will make small but meaningful changes to our local housing policies. Healdsburg has been on a trajectory of development, whether it's hotels that I believe we have built an overabundance of in recent years, uh, or luxury homes, whether it's at the Montage or other places in town, um, because that's the policies that we have in place now. Uh, the growth management ordinance that was adopted by voters has led to unintended consequences. We have not built middle income housing in Healdsburg in a meaningful way since the growth management ordinance was passed back in the year 2000. The growth management ordinance was created because people didn't like Parkland Farms, because they thought that neighborhood was sprawl and that we didn't need homes like that in our community. That neighborhood, when we go out and knock on doors as, as candidates right now, that is a thriving neighborhood where the majority of people are families raising kids. It's a middle class neighborhood. Um, it's where seniors and our workforce lives, and, and it's a great place to live. And we aren't able to have those homes be affordable anymore, unfortunately. Um, we also have more water use per capita than any other city in our region because we have so many single family homes. So I believe this solution that focuses on multifamily housing, focuses on infill development, not sprawl, and gets us away from building luxury or building more hotels and building the housing we need, it's the best solution for Healdsburg and I hope folks learn more and vote yes. Mr. Hagley. Yeah, I absolutely support Measure O. Um, like Councilmember Kelly said, you know, this is something that we took a very measured, calculated approach to what would work. And, you know, I'm running for re-election. Uh, just like I said, when I first ran, it's about housing. We've done an excellent job on the income-restricted housing. There's a lot that's coming down the pipeline that is really going to help a lot of people that are doubled and tripled up into uh, current housing. Um, to be able to find a place to live and have their own home. With Measure O, we looked at where is it, what is it that we need? And we need the multifamily, higher density, condos, apartments, that, that type of housing that's market rate. Uh, and our focus is to try to get higher density by uh, making them smaller units. Now, one of the, there's a lot of misinformation out there. One of them relates to the, the, downtown capacity study. And I think what people need to understand is that was just a study. Our direction was look at these five specific lots, the abandoned gas station, Rite Aid, um, Bank of America, the little spot across from Cousteau, and then the West Plaza parking lot. And tell us what's the max that we could get on there so that so the community could visualize it. And that was just an example to see what it would look like um, but that does not mean that we're going to do that. As long as I'm on council, my goal is to get middle income housing, not more luxury housing. And I'll that is something that I truly believe in. The next question is, do you support County Measure J, which would prohibit concentrated animal feeding operations and unincorporated areas of the county? Why or why not? Mr. Higley, we'll start with you. I do not support Measure J. I, I don't like uh, uh, activists from out of the county coming here to tell us uh, what to do. Um, you know, my daughter's been very involved in 4-H and FFA, and I've gotten to know the a lot of our farming community and just really the 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 culture around that and how much what it means to our community, what it means to our local businesses. Um, I just think Measure J is a bad idea. Vote no on Measure J. 
Mr. Edwards. I am strongly against Measure J. I have seen what happens when non-farmers try to regulate farmers. Uh, in our cannabis program at the state, it's become a disaster. Uh, our farmers here in Sonoma County produce most of the organic dairy products in the state. They are very good regenerative farmers. There are a few bad actors, but the overall majority of our farmers do a very good job of being regenerative in their care of their animals. And it just is not the way to approach it. We need to work with our farmers. Our farmers are doing a great job. And, you know, when you look at Sonoma County compared to the real factory farms, if you've ever driven down Highway 5 past Kalinga, where those cows are just standing in that mud, that's not what's happening here. And those cows, if this is passed, we will lose farm workers because those farm workers live on the dairies because you cannot get up and go to work at two o'clock in the morning to milk cows. You have to be on site. So those cows that are getting great care, uh, our chickens are, are great. We have a very local uh, produce producer that do a great job, have great organic materials. And all, if this ends, all you're going to be doing is forcing these animals down to the Central Valley. We will use create more greenhouse gas of getting that product back here because people aren't going to stop drinking milk or having dairy products or eating chicken. So it's important to have those sources local to reduce our greenhouse gases and local farms are the best way to go. Ms. Hannon Kramer. I am no on Jay um, wholeheartedly as well. Um, I, I believe that we need to support farmers, um, particularly here locally in our county. Um, and, you know, the, there's flawed policy around the way J is presented and written. So um, I think there, I agree with, you know, um, Ms. Kelly and um, David and Ron in the sense that we absolutely have generations of farmers here in Healdsburg that, Healdsburg that we need to support. And, you know, to turn our back on them makes no sense. Um, it would really cause so many other issues within um, our climate and economy that are just not reasonable and don't make any sense. So absolutely no on Jay and definitely supporting local farmers. Ms. Kelly. I am no on Jay. I think that the county did a study that really looked at the economic impacts of what Measure J would do. Um, we have a, a predominantly agriculturally based economy across this county and, and it's really a part of what makes Sonoma County so special. And I believe that with the interconnected nature of so many of our agricultural operators and the businesses that support agriculture, uh, it's not just the farms that would be shut down and those workers who would lose their jobs, which would be incredibly devastating. Uh, and the way that the measure is written uh, does not really help to support those folks transitioning to other positions uh, that would that would help help them sustain here. Um, it really looks at all of the different ancillary and supportive businesses that would be completely shuttered uh, if this were to pass, and some that you wouldn't even assume have anything to do with, with animal farming, even vegetable farmers and the feed shops or the tractor mechanics who, su who support those businesses, those folks would also go out of business. Uh, so the economic impacts, the secondary and tertiary impacts are pretty great, um, pretty devastating. And, and folks, if they're concerned, you know, should read the report that the county commissioned. Uh, I will say that I think animal welfare should be taken very seriously. And we have mostly great actors within this space in Sonoma County and those who are striving to do better. Of course, like any industry, I'm sure there are bad actors out there, um, but that's why we have really strong state regulations already in place to protect and prevent uh, whether it's erosion or water challenges, and we need to enforce those existing rules. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Ms. Kay. I am Noan Jay. As a matter of fact, the City Council wrote a letter as a opposing Jay, and the only one I think is for Jay would be Evelyn Mitchell. I believe in supporting family farms, uh, farmers feed people, and people need to eat. So, and people need to work. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Our next question is, do you support State Proposition 33, which would allow cities and counties to adopt or expand rent control? Why or why not? And we'll start with you, Ms. Kate. I'm a big believer in the free market and 
I don't think rent control helps any anyone. I uh, appreciate I'm a renter myself and I appreciate people who invest in property and provide homes. And most people are reasonable and want to have people renting their homes. So I don't think mandating, I don't even believe in the minimum wage. <laughs> so I'm no, I don't believe 33 is going to help by uh, rent control. Mr. Hagley. Um, I have not read through the text of measure uh, 33. Um, but as a general rule, I tend to shy away from rent control. Um, I'm a big believer in trying to make more housing available uh, so that rent is affordable. Um, and I, I just struggle with sometimes the, the, the demonizing of housing providers. Um, we have a lot of uh, small um, apartment and property owners. And earlier, somebody mentioned about, you know, working with Reach for Home and trying to talk to landlords about, you know, we need more housing available for people transitioning out of homelessness. And one of the challenges is, if you have a problem tenant, you can't get rid of them. Now, like with everything, there are bad actors on the landlord space, just like there are on the tenant space. And I think it's really important that there is that balance. I, I, I tend to shy away from that and look at it from a, a local perspective um, and, you know, really focus on how do we make sure, and this is where I've been a leader over the last eight years, is making sure that we can, you know, how, how do we help uh, apartments that are going to flip to market get acquired by Burbank Housing to keep our neighbors in those units with income restricted. But we need that naturally occurring market rate housing so that people have a place to live that are, make too much to qualify for the income restricted units. Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm a no on 33. I think that when you restrict uh, and put more regulations on, you, you force the small landlord out of business. And that's really what drives affordable rentals. Um, in Hillsburg, for example, years ago, 30 years ago when I got here, you know, if somebody needed a house for rent, you could say, hey, go to your neighbor and say, hey, you've got that house over on uh, Fitch Mountain. Uh, you know, my kid is coming back into town. And you had landlords that were really there to make a small profit. But as you add these layers and layers of regulation, you end up with what I call spreadsheet corporate landlords, where it's just too hard for the small individual landlord to rent to people. And so when you also make things more scarce, more difficult, it's definitely going to raise the rate. Uh, and it just is not an effective way to go. What we really need to do is work on more housing, not more restrictions. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Um, well, I think it's really easy for non-renters and people not in that space right now to feel they have an opinion on an, a, an issue that they're, they aren't currently experiencing. I can speak from experience. Um, I experienced, we experienced as a family housing insecurity here in Healdsburg over the summer. Um, I thought it was completely intolerable. Um, I am absolutely yes on 33. Um, and I think that, you know, rent control and eliminating statewide bans um, you know, allowing for renters to have more rights is always a good thing. I think having the conversation and making sure that, you know, um, the Latino families up the street aren't getting pushed out of their five unit building because, you know, um, the property owner decided to sell because he wants to turn a profit. I mean, it's not restrictions. It's opening up the door for, for low income and middle income housing people to be able to afford um, you know, what they want for their family and to be able to thrive in our community. Um, I think, you know, not having any of those protections is really problematic and, you know, led to, you know, someone like myself and my husband and our two daughters experiencing, you know, the really unfortunate situation of, you know, being pushed out of a house and not really having a lot of rights because there were loopholes in the system and, you know, we weren't in multifamily housing. And so um, I absolutely support Prop 33. Thank you. Our final question, uh, here it is at 741. That's close to 743 for our final question. Uh, another question from the audience. What is your position on the city's climate mobilization strategy? Specifically, how will you help reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings and homes? And we start with Ms. Kelly. 
Um, excuse me, Mr. Masters, I did not get a chance to answer that last question. Is it possible for me to answer that oh, question? Oh, absolutely. My or, mistake. My mistake. No worries. Thank you so Go much. Um, so Prop 33 uh, is actually something very different than most folks on this uh, body uh, mentioned. So it really isn't uh, the ability to enact rent control. What it does is it brings local options to local cities. It, it brings rent control. Okay, here we came back. Ms. Kelly, I'm going to ask you to start your answer again, because seconds after you started, the candidates started freezing. So we, we, I think we are all back. As far as I can tell, everybody's moving on their screen. But uh, within a few seconds after you started your answer, uh, well, we've lost one. Okay, like Ms. Kate uh, is not with us. But please go ahead and start your answer again on Prop 33. Okay, so Prop 33, it's endorsed by the State Democratic Party. It's endorsed by um, labor leader Dolores Huerta. It's endorsed by uh, labor organizations and, and folks across the state. And really what it does is it puts the option of whether or not to enact rent control in the hands of local government. Right now, there's a state uh, control on rent control where it doesn't allow cities to make decisions for its own communities. So a lot of people who say we just want local control because we want to be able to make decisions for our own community um, on a nuanced basis, uh, that's what this law would do. It would allow a city or a county uh, to maintain or en enact uh, or expand residential rent control. Uh, so I support that because I do think the city should be able to make a decision. Um, we have 40% of our city are renters. Uh, they don't have any representation on our city council. And I think that's really unfortunate. And we have lots of folks in our community who are paying way too much in rent uh, and it's challenging for them. Number one, we need to build more housing. I, and that is not uh, related to rent control and we need to pass uh, local uh, challenge to our growth management ordinance like Measure O, which will allow us to get that housing built so we can have more folks have more options. Um, but as it stands right now, uh, we have people really struggling in our community, people getting evicted through rent raises, there's so many loopholes in the state rent control ordinance that are not helping everyday people be able to live and thrive in their communities, and people are falling into homelessness because of it. All right, our final question. What is your position on the city's climate mobilization strategy? Specifically, how will you help reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings and homes? Ms. Kelly, we start with you. Thank you. Well, as the city's representative to the Regional Climate Protection Authority, I'm really proud of the work that we've done in championing and bringing together the climate mobilization strategy that our council adopted uh, unanimously about a year or so ago. I think, unfortunately, in the 11th hour, a lot of the issues were gutted out of the strategy um, by folks that are running for council. And I think people should really ask questions of why some of that great work that we paid for from our climate consultants, some of the national leading experts uh, that came to our city that we paid for their guidance, um, why we didn't listen to their recommendations. I also wanna thank the dozens of community folks who stepped up to participate in that process to, to participate in countless meetings, Climate Action Healdsburg and the leadership there um, for being a part of it. Um, every city, every business, every uh, school needs to participate in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions so that we can turn the tide on climate change. Our planet is warming um, at, an, uh, at a rate that is going to basically make it unlivable. And there are national leading scientists. I know I, I have someone up here who's actually a climate denier, so I can't wait to hear what she thinks about this answer. However, um, we need to do everything that we can and including reducing greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. It's the number two next to transportation, the second largest source of emissions. And we need to create incentives for people who own buildings, who are homeowners or who are renters to be able to uh, purchase in new appliances to reduce the emissions from our buildings. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Gas. Ms. Kate. Thank you. I'm not a climate denier. I believe in climate. And uh, in the 80s, Al Gore was saying the same things that you're saying right now. And I've been around here long enough to know that rain comes. And I, I do believe in being prudent about 
energy. And I believe in being energy diversified. I don't think going all electric in homes or automobiles is going to save the earth. So uh, being earth energy diversified is the way that, that I see. I see uh, people invested in electric that are going to make a lot of money on changing out appliances and selling cars and lithium batteries are not good for the environment and packing people in into 65 units per, uh, I didn't get to speak on measure O, but I was fine with that because I understand we have a time constraint. So the climate mobilization strategy doesn't seem like it has people's health or the environment's health at um, first at hand. That's my stance. Yeah, I I was very proud of what we did with the climate mobilization strategy and this comment about gutting it. Really, the, the issues that I had with it were where we went beyond what the state was mandating, which then ended up getting thrown out uh, in Berkeley uh, due to a lawsuit. So I think we need to be careful because in Healdsburg, we have a lot of people that uh, I, I feel like have climate privilege. You can afford to be go way beyond what the average citizen can do. And so I'm a big believer in incentives versus penalties. Um, the the bigger area that I think we, we really need to focus on things that can really move the needle. And I've served as uh, on NCPA. I'm actually here at the annual conference for the Northern California Power Agency, where we are actually doing more to move the needle than things like, you know, banning leaf blowers and things like that. Like my focus is what we're doing with the Lodi Energy Center, trying to convert that to uh, use hydrogen production to generate power during the day. That's 300 megawatts that we could uh, switch over from from uh, natural gas uh, to fire up the uh, and create power. Um, so I think there's a lot that we can do. We have, you know, at one point, the nation's largest floating solar project. There's a lot of exciting things that we're doing doing in Healdsburg. And I absolutely support the climate mobilization strategy that we voted on unanimously and look to make sure that, uh, you know, as funding is available, that we can make sure we get those things done and move toward a, a cleaner future for our children. Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I think one of the things we need to remember is that the effects of climate uh, have a double impact on those in the lower income range. The effects affect them and they pay for it more. And that's one of the things that on the council I'm very concerned about is that when we are giving incentives that we also make sure that those incentives aren't going to people who can afford to pay for those incentives and make that choice. I think it's great that we have a lot of people in town who are going to solar, who have EVs, but I don't want our lower income residents to have to pay for that. It was a very interesting conversation uh, that I had when I went to climate meetings in Healdsburg versus one that the NAACP did. It was very different. It was more like things of, we need to get back to carpooling, where instead of each parent driving their kid individually to school to where one parent picks up kids and we get back to carpooling, we get back to working with our neighbors, those are things that have real immediate impact. They're not costing the city money, but just good old fashioned neighbors helping out each other. And so I think that we did a really good job at looking at the climate and balancing those economic impacts on our citizens. And so I'm very happy with our climate. In fact, Measure O, having more local housing so that people are not driving into town, only 15% of our workers actually live and work in town. So if we get more housing where people can actually live in town, walk to work and not have to leave town because rents are too high, um, that will help us because our biggest contribution is our vehicle miles traveled to the greenhouse gas effects. Ms. Hannon Kramer. Yeah, I, this is an incredibly important issue, um, especially if you have young kids and you are concerned at all about the future. I mean, the climate is in crisis, period. I mean, we can talk about privilege and incentives. I mean, I think it, at this point, it needs to be a flat out effort to do whatever we can to um, execute the plan that we have in place um, and make sure that we are you know, moving as fast as possible to mitigate where we're going with, you know, the climate crisis in general. It's it's here in Healdsburg, you know, it's it's international. This is not something that, you know, we're talking about that's really limited by privilege or incentive. I think, you know, not moving fast enough and and 
really having leadership and council that understands that, that that we are in crisis and that it is a priority and should be something that we pay attention to very closely and making sure that we're executing on what we voted in in the plan. Um, I think, you know, the city has so many great things um, ahead. You know, we have a really nimble and efficient city staff with Jeff Kay and Andrew Sternfels. Um, I think we are so blessed to have organizations like Climate Action Healdsburg, um, 350 Bay Area, um, who I've, I've been endorsed by, Sierra Club, SECA. I think it's really critical to keep having these conversations and understand that it is, it is a priority and needs to be moved on as fast as possible. Um and again, we need, you know, leadership that will stand up and fight for these strategies and make sure that they're implemented as soon as possible. This is the question portion of our forum. Each candidate will now have one minute for their closing statement. We begin with Ms. Hannon Kramer. Muted. Sorry. Um, I think, you know, Healdsburg's at a real inflection point. Again, um, you know, I think the mission in this election is really clear for Healdsburg City Council. You know, you have three incumbents um, and then you have two external um, candidates. Um, I understand that I'm in my rookie season, but I do have a lot of passion for the issues at hand. And, you know, I am living a living example of what's happening in Healdsburg and some of the issues. Um, I feel like I would bring firsthand knowledge to address those things as a renter. Um, as a husband who is, you know, a union, we're a union supported family, understanding, understanding the needs of workers. Um, I felt inspired to jump into this race because I know I can add value from day one and, and using my business experience um, in strategy. So I think, you know, in Healdsburg, you know, I keep running around town saying you've got to vote the change you want to see. And particularly around issues in, in climate and housing and arts and culture um, that affect our city now, but in the future. And we really need leaders that are going to be future focused um, to make sure that we get there for our children's sake and for our seniors. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to speak tonight. And now Mr. Edwards will give a closing statement. Yeah, and to date, I have knocked on 2,303 doors, walked over 60 miles in this town to actually talk to the residents. I mean, that's really the core values of Healdsburg is getting out in the community, talking to them. I'm not mailing this in. I didn't last time. I'm not doing it this time. And I think that the residents of Healdsburg trusted me to step in, to learn what's going on, and to really represent them. And I will continue to do that. I'm a lifelong Democrat. Uh, I may be more center left than some others. I'm not a progressive, but I placed my first vote in 19, 1977. And I will continue to show up, be prepared. In fact, this summer, uh, I'm proud that I'm retired because I was able to fill in uh, board seats for every member of this council when people weren't able to do that. I'm the guy that they were able to call to show up and to be there. And I wanna continue to do this job for Hillsburg and represent a broad community that's been here and understands this community quite well. And now Mr. Hengeley will give a closing statement. My appreciation of Healdsburg continually grows through the various perspectives I've experienced over the years. From date nights to play dates, Little League to 4-H, Live Oak to Greyhounds next year, Healdsburg is where our family's roots are firmly planted. Serving Healdsburg as a council member the last eight years has given me a front row seat to what really makes Healdsburg special, seeing you at our fun events or helping those in need. Sitting on the Healdsburg High School Scholarship Committee, I've seen how our local businesses offer world-class internships that don't exist anywhere else. I've also felt that concern and fear from you when the Healdsburg we love was threatened by the Kincaid fire in 2019. I made a conscious effort to try and conduct interviews from the plaza so our neighbors who are scattered all over the Bay Area could hear and feel that Healdsburg was okay. When the governor called me to tell me the evacuation order was being lifted, my first thought was to tell you, Healdsburg, it's time to come home. That sums it up for me. I love that Healdsburg is where I am home. Thank you for your vote. And now Ms. Cade will give a closing statement. I love and care about people and families and the freedom that our United States and California constitutions guarantee. I'm a renter, so I can fill that void. If you vote for me, I will do my due diligence to the best of my ability 
to make the necessary changes, Hillsburg residents and small businesses so they can thrive again, including staying energy diversified and, and bringing some leadership and accountability so we don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants. My name is Linda Cade and I ask for your vote on November 5th so that I can follow through on my promise. Thank you. And now Ms. Kelly will give a closing statement. Thanks so much to the League of Women Voters for having us tonight. Uh, I'm a passionate nonprofit executive, a community leader, a former Sonoma County Planning Commissioner, and a mom of two amazing kids. I'm running for re-election because I believe we need steady leadership to follow through on the goals and commitments that we've initiated. Uh, serving as council member and mayor last year has been an honor and a responsibility I do not take lightly. I remain dedicated to improving the quality of life in Healdsburg, and we can work together to create a thriving and sustainable community. I co-founded Corazon Healdsburg, and during the pandemic, I led a small business recovery organization to keep small businesses open. I will keep using my experience to find solutions to our city's toughest challenges, investing in infrastructure, creating more affordable housing, and preserving parks and open spaces. I'm proud to have the support of State Senator Mike McGuire, Congressman Jared Huffman, Supervisor James Gore, Supervisor Linda Hopkins, and dozens of others. I'm endorsed by the Sonoma County Democratic Party, the Sierra Club, Conservation Action, and local firefighters. You can learn more about me at arielkelly.com. I'd be honored to have your vote. That ends the closing statement portion of our forum. We're proud to have impressive and committed people running for this office, and we thank you for your service to the county. We wish the best of luck to all the candidates. A big thank you to the 11 volunteers who made this virtual forum possible. You can't see them. Most of them are behind <laughs> the scenes. We encourage everyone to get out and vote. Please encourage your friends and family to watch the recording of this forum on the League of Women Voters and Sonoma County YouTube channel. See the link at our website, lwvsonoma.org. For more information on candidates and ballot measures, check out the Vote411 website, vote411.org. Thank you and good night.